parking tickets and leave me alone. Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> you still believe in ghosts, pea brain He's a closet! This is all the whiskey you possess? Everyone out of the way of the bulldozer! Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. I am Richard. Folks or people, I am joined by Jeffrey. Hello, Jeffrey. Hello, Richard. Oh, he's got his literature voice on. I like yes. it. Doing something <laughs> different today or, or tonight or this morning on the show. It is... We're talking about horror fiction because you and I, we've never really talked about it on air. And it was only very recently that we actually talked about horror fiction off air, which is not on a podcast. That's different. That's the it's other It's in the talking. air still. Yeah. Like, you know, that's how sound works. Ew. I believe that you like horror literature and horror fiction. I like it a little bit. Good. Because then, because I don't want to be in trouble. <laughs> uh, recently, I got back into horror, reading horror fiction. I did as a kid, and maybe at the end of this wonderful picking your brain, um, I'll run through like the five things I've read. We'll uh. save we'll save my experiences for the end. But uh, paperbacks from hell, that book uh, by Grady Hendrix was something that. Is there two authors? Does it have more than one author? There is, yes. Um, see, real heads uh, know that if you're a fan of uh, the paperbacks from hell genre, there is a there's a blog, a very important blog, yes, called yes. Too Much Horror Fiction, run by the uh, the co-author Will Erickson. Oh, that's the other guy. Um, okay, so Will Erickson and Grady Hendrix. Yes, that uh, blog is amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's I've learned of so many wonderful things throughout the years um, from that blog. Um, it's a valuable, invaluable even resource uh, for those who like the uh, night bumpy reads. <laughs> <laughs> so those things, those two things combined reignited my interest in reading horror fiction. And that is where I will like stop talking because I am here. <laughs> To extricate all of the Jeffy bits from your brain. The mm. Jeffy bits? They're very spongy bits. <laughs> let's let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to um since I can't prove that you're real, mm -hmm. even if I met you in person, you're still outside of my consciousness. So I literally don't know if you're a real person or not. Yeah, when you blink, but, I, I'm, I disappear. That's actually. so scary. I'm so sorry. I will never blink again. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about your earliest memories of reading horror fiction. What were your your close encounters of the, the first kind? Right. So very co uh, coincidentally and fortuitously, my uh, earliest childhood re reading memories are all tied into horror fiction. Yes. Because uh, that's pretty much all that I read as a kid. Um, it's all I was watching, too. Uh, and so when you combine these two things together, I think that explains a lot about me uh, as an individual. So I wanted to run through some of the ones that I liked most as a kid and have the either the most specific mem well all right let's let's put it like this uh, all of these memories are very very specific and vivid and yet some of them i can remember the texts very well and others i don't remember at all other than like the covers right. which if you are a fan of uh horror fiction you know that uh that approximately 60 percent of uh, their appeal and your enjoyment of them is the wonderful cover art reading them is you know only about 40 percent <laughs> um, so so this is uh, my childhood memories uh, are a little bit of a, a blend of the two um so some of the ones that i have the the most uh poignant memories of actually reading and you know that i still read now i mean i, I still read all of these now uh but uh First big one, which I'm sure you're familiar with as well, are the uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark trilogy. 
by Alvin Schwartz, the renowned folklorist, uh, with the beautiful and totally uh, grisly illustrations <laughs> by Stephen Gamel. Oh, yes. So so you like these, right? You've read them? Um, I've read, I want to say, the third one, mm-hmm. and that's it. I had, I had never seen these as a kid, but I was very curious about them and was able to check out the third one from my library. So it was, it was way different than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, for sure. They're, um, I mean, they were on the banned books list for like, you know, most of my childhood. Um, that first, I can't remember when the first one came out. The first one definitely came out like before I was born. Um, and it sort of picked up steam and then never really fell off. And it's still like a bestseller, you know. Um, they did for a while get rid of the Gamal illustrations and got another person to do the illustrations. And everybody was like, this is no. bullshit. Put, put, put them back. Put them back. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the first one, uh, the first one came out in 1981. Um, and then the second volume, 1984. And then the third volume in 1991. Um, wow. so I think probably around 1991 when the third one was released, it was like a, you know, big, big build up for it. And, uh, and I, I got all of those books, um, very important to me, uh, not only because I read them all the time. Uh, in fact, my, uh, <laughs> my original edition of scary stories to tell in the dark, the first, uh, volume, uh, which I still own. Uh, has on the very last page uh, with the last story, uh, which is the ghost with the bloody fingers story. Uh, it still has a band aid that I put on the illustration of the ghost with bloody fingers. Uh, <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> wait, wait, um, you were trying to help him to stop bleeding, or you, yeah, it, it freaked you out and you wanted to cover his face. I was just trying to help him out. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, 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 the important thing about these is that they're, they're pretty, I, well, interactive is maybe the wrong word, but you know they're very much structured as um, almost like pieces of of folklore or activities, like storytelling activities that you could do in person, um, because that's how a lot of these you know folk tales were originally told. Uh, so we, uh, by we I mean my mother and I, uh, and really my mother, uh, made a a birthday party for me when I was quite young. Uh, that was scary stories to tell in the dark themed. And uh, we did like readings and uh, activities based on all the stories and poems and songs. That was a very memorable uh, birthday party for me. Um, So scary stories tell in dark essential. Uh, And the the movie version from a couple of years ago is is good too. Oh yeah. I like Um, that one. Yeah. It does a, I think a pretty nice job of, uh, of, adapting some of the tales hey you got you got the famous moment from the books where the kids uh fish and poops out of the toilet that is yeah that is the my favorite story um the poop fisher <laughs> <laughs> i come to fish your poops <laughs> Uh, second, uh, very important for anyone, uh, my age, uh, would of course be the Goosebumps books by one R.L. Stein. Nice. Um, I, I wasn't much of a reader, um, before the Goosebumps books came into my life. Um, not that I was like, I couldn't read or was a bad, I was just totally uninterested in reading, uh, in, you know, first, second grade, and then, uh, picked up the Goosebumps books. And then it was a religious experience, and I bought every one, had the full set all through, I think, the early days of the follow-up series, Goosebumps 2000. Um, they're, you know, reading them now, they're very goofy. Um, there's still some that I think have a little bit of an appeal. Um, I love them all, uh, unabashedly, even the ones that are just, you know, total farts. Um, but <laughs> uh, there are some really good ones that I would stand by today. Um some of my most vivid memories, uh, You Can't Scare Me about the Mud Monsters is a really good one uh, fairly early in the series. There's uh, The Barking Ghost, which has a totally ludicrous uh, ending where a boy turns into a squirrel and is kind of stuck that way forever. <laughs> uh, but it's got a really great cover art that just stuck with me forever. Um, the Headless Ghost is a great one. Calling All Creeps has this extremely, uh, um, call it a, uh, um, a totally pessimistic and ultimately, uh, depressing ending 
about giving into peer pressure from a bunch of shape shifting lizard people. Oh my god. Yeah, it's a it's a good one. I like that one a lot. Um, have you ever read any Goosebumps books? No, I was too old for them. When they, mm-hmm. I mean, that was God. Uh, when was I working at the bookstore? I was working at Walden Books, and I want to say ninety six, and mm-hmm. they were hot. Like, oh yeah, they were freaking huge. We had an entire. Uh, like kiosk or whatever, uh, dedicated just to Goosebumps. And uh, these kids would come in and buy, you know, 14 or 15 of them. Oh, sure. And it was uh, it was just crazy. And I always had to ask their parents, do you guys have a preferred reader card? It's a great program. Um, you'll save 20% on this purchase. If you mm. spend over $100, then you get $20 <laughs> back. Um, also it's, it's only 10 bucks a month and it really pays for itself, Jeffrey. <laughs> wow. 10 bucks a month is a hard sell in the nineties. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I, I was, mean, even like the Barnes and Noble member thing is like 20 bucks a year, 10 dude, bucks a month. That's why Walden books is out of business. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you, I purchased many a goosebump at a, uh, at a Walden books. Oh, you should have shoplifted them. Jesus. <laughs> I would have supported you. I never, I never have ever reported a shoplifter. In all of my retail experience, I would just nod and smile because <laughs> I knew they were stealing. Didn't care. Tip of the hat. Yep. <laughs> um, some other uh, important ones from my childhood. There was sort of a, he was a little bit more, well, no, actually, I, I think he, he covers a lot of the same ground that, you know, Stein did over his career, but he was sort of a hometown hero from the Syracuse region, Bruce Coville. Um, he had uh, a number of works that fell into spooky stuff. He also did a lot of science fiction stuff that was kind of spooky, too, um, and some fantasy as well. But um, one that really stuck with me because it had uh, some local interest for people in the Syracuse region is one called the ghost in the third row, um, which is a great middle grade novel. I read it uh, again just a couple of years ago and it, it held up. I mean, it's a kid's book, but it was a very entertaining one. Uh, that's sort of a, uh, a ghostly mystery uh, that's inspired by this uh, beautiful theater. It used to be an actual movie theater, but and I think they still show movies there every once in a while. Um, but it was transitioned into like a theatrical theater in Syracuse called the Landmark, uh, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I urge you and listeners to uh, uh, to Google image search it so you can see this beautiful place. And you take one look at it, and you're like, yeah, it's haunted. Uh, <laughs> so it's got this uh, uh, this legend, which we even went on um, you know field trips when I was in uh, grade school to this uh, Landmark Theater, and they would like tell you the legends of the ghost there. Uh, it was uh, the cool. ghost of an actress who fell from the balcony and died and haunts the place still. Uh, so this, uh, this mystery about this precocious, uh, sort of mystery tween who, uh, who goes there and helps the spirit move on was a really, uh, really memorable and uh, enjoyable book from this time period for me. And then I have uh, some that, uh, I didn't really read back then, um, but were very important for other reasons. Mostly again, those, uh, just like holding them and looking at them and maybe like reading the first chapter or so, you know, not having any very clear memories about them. Although I've revisited them since and they're, they're quite fun. So I've, I've gotten very into the teen horror books of that period uh, as an adult. Right. Um, but back then I didn't really read many of them. Um, there was this one though, that has an extremely striking cover called the principal by MC Sumner. Uh, the principal is about uh, a principal who is a vampire and he's like killing kids in the school. And it has a great <laughs> cover of a hand popping out of a principal's office door like a vampire hand just going right through the glass of the principal office door um this was a book that was purchased for my older brother and read to him um after an accident and uh it really stuck in my memory um just like hiding around a corner listening to a little bit of the book being read and being like "Ooh, that sounds scary uh, wow. and uh yeah it's not really but uh it's a it's a fun book for sure the uh, uh last one that sort of fits into this uh 
this genre of like uh, striking text that that I didn't necessarily read back then uh, are the uh, and I've told you about these the and I think you're aware of them too the uh, Halloween YA novels yes um, by I believe Kelly O'Rourke is the name of the author on those in the 90s I wonder around what was there a, there must have been a movie that was out at that point um because I'm wondering why they would have published these usually it's to tie into uh one of the films that's coming out 97 was that around the time of um Curse of Michael Myers when's that one around the same yeah, time roundabouts yeah roundabouts so a couple years after the curse of michael myers they release a few ya teen horror novels featuring michael myers um the cover art for these is wonderful um i picked these up they're hot collector's items now they go for at at, at the least like 150 bucks online if you're trying oh to find God. them uh there's a lot if, if you look around there's a lot of uh teen uh, horror novels for th- there's some teen horror novels um from freddy that tied into new nightmare yep. um there's some crystal lake books uh with jason um there's a f- f- bunch of different ones uh they're all extremely hard to find and these are some of the hardest to find um i have them all in mint condition because i bought them from the supermarket back in 97 <laughs> um, and uh, just stared at them and again definitely read some chapters but never really uh, dug too deep into them I've, I've again since revisited them and they're they're pretty fun uh as far as as far as these things go yeah i've um, re- i've managed to read through interlibrary loan i was able to get loans of two of the freddy ones mm-hmm. and one of the jason ones and one of the freddy ones was so good mm-hmm. that i was like why didn't they make this into a movie this would have been perfect so perfect it felt like just like something nice to to wedge in between like three and four or between three and five it was definitely a a solid enough book to fit in that era of the um the freddy franchise and the the one about jason was terrible (laughs) it was okay i mean it was obviously fun to read that definitely no not a waste of time but man it was Uh like i was like this doesn't work for anything it was the uh jason's spirit possessing people Mm. the the nerd of the book finds jason's mask and uh becomes jason by putting it on and he he goes from being like a 95 pound weakling to a 250 pound seven foot hulking jason so uh, (laughs) that's how it happens yep not so Um, hot there's also a whole series of uh, Jason X books, if you, if you didn't know. <laughs> really? There's a whole series. There's multiple Jason X books that are like sequels, I guess, to what? Jason X. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want more of that content, it's out there. <laughs> I'm not sure. <sighs> so so that wraps up my childhood horrors. Um, all the all the stuff that shaped me. Nice. I, and what a shape you have. Yeah, shape Lee. Yeah, yeah. I can see. Mm-hmm. Even though your video's off, I can tell. Mm-hmm. So what about um, classic literature? Like, you know, in the vein of uh, uh, Martin Shelley's Frankenman, <laughs> the Brometheus <laughs> paradox? No, like like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and, uh, of course, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Like, what's some of the, uh, the real highbrow horror classics that you enjoy? Yeah, so I actually put Dracula and Frankenstein on my list first. Of course. Largely because I actually feel like most people don't read them. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, most people actually just watch the movies and are like, oh, I, or you just like see a, a Halloween mask and say, I got it. I got them. They're good. <laughs> I'm guilty. I know what they, I'm guilty. I know what they are. Um, the books are really interesting. Um, I think they're both pretty interesting. Frankenstein, I think, is the better. Well, Frankenstein is the more interesting and complex and thought provoking of the two. Um, Dracula is just kind of like a rip roaring good time. It's definitely got its own points of interest to it, um, but you have to dig a little bit deeper. It's it's not quite there on the surface um, or necessarily like intended. But yeah, both of them are, are totally wonderful novels, largely different from, you know, 98% of the adaptations or uses of the characters that you'll find uh, on screen. Um, and it's actually really fun once you've read them to then go watch the hundreds and hundreds of adaptations of them and uh, see the the ways sometimes quite good and sometimes quite bad that they have been uh, played around with. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend them. I think that uh, if you haven't read them and you like horror, what are you doing? Go, <laughs> go read them. <laughs> what am I doing? No, I have read Frankenstein, but mm-hmm. um, I have never sat down with uh, good old Dracula because I am not big on the epistolary. Is that the right word? Epistolary? Yeah. Uh, the the novels of letters those just get on my nerves. So I've also never read. Um, is it Jekyll and Hyde that's also yeah told the letters? Yeah. I gotta get I gotta get over that. Yes, I will read them. I have that. You know, every horror fan walks into Barnes and Noble and goes, "Man, I need that <laughs> fancy uh, le- faux leather, leather cover." Faux leather. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> cover of dracula better bring that home and read it someday dracula is more of like a um a documentary type like scrapbook type um storytelling so it's not all letters although there are a lot of letters there's lots of diary entries newspaper clippings uh stuff like that mixed in so it's a a slightly more varied take on the epistolary novel yeah read them read them read them everybody read them um, moving forward, uh, for the rest of this section and the sections to follow, I did want to note that I'm keeping things accessible in my recommendations. Okay. Uh, by that, I mean things that are in print and fairly easy to find. Ah. Cause I mean, I guess we should have prefaced like I'm a pretty deep horror collector. Um, I buy things that are pretty rare and uh, nobody's heard of them. And if you want to find a copy, it's like there's one guy in Kansas who's trying to sell it for three hundred dollars. Yes. And you have to talk him down. (laughs) Um, It's so I I don't want to recommend stuff like that, even though I would, you know, like to. And that's largely what I'm like, you know, reading and interested in now. Uh, Like I'm reading this fairly notorious horror novel at the moment. Um, It is a book that was only published. uh, It was published twice, once here in uh, America and then uh, in the UK later on that same year in 1977. Uh, It's a novel called Eat Them Alive by Pierce Nace, uh, who is an author nobody knows anything about, probably a pseudonym. Uh, Some detectives online say that this person was maybe an old woman, uh, which is actually hilarious when you know what the book is about. Uh, (laughs) The book is is about a guy named Dyke Mellis, uh, who has been... (laughs) who has been uh, castrated by his buddies and lives on an island. Uh, But on the opening pages of the book, this big earthquake happens. And by page three, he's uh, witnessing all of these giant uh, human-sized praying mantises spill forth from a chasm out into the earth and just devouring people. And, uh, you know, you might imagine your first thought is, uh, I'm going to run away from those things. Uh, His first thought is, Hmm, can I capture one and tame it and then bring it back to America to devour the people who wronged me? Oh my god. <laughs> and, uh, that's exactly uh, how the book goes from there. Um, it's a, <laughs> a totally singular book. Um, but you know, uh, my copy, uh, which is the English edition cost a a shit ton of money that I will not tell you how much I I paid for it. (laughs) So, So, (laughs) uh, I like that. So my, my goal is to avoid recommending stuff like that, that are, that's just going to drive you crazy and you can't access. Um, because I want our listeners to experience, um, you know, the gems of horror fiction that are, are fairly easily accessible. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I picked a few other classics that are um, not exactly off the beaten path. But, you know, if, you, if you're listening to this uh, podcast and you're mostly familiar with horror movies, uh, you might you know be familiar with these authors, but you might not have actually checked them out because you, you just don't read a lot. But you should. Reading is great. So uh, first up, uh, M.R. James, um, the classic English ghost story writer. Are oh, yeah. you familiar with M.R. James? I am indeed. Mm-hmm. Have you ever read any of his work or you've just seen like the ghost stories for Christmas? I have actually read one or two of his short stories and then I've seen a ton of the adaptations. Right. You know, if you're a fan of um, particularly like English television productions, a number of his uh, uh, stories have been adapted by the BBC, um, particularly in the, the 70s. Although uh, like Mark Gaddis of uh, Sherlock and... Um, Doctor Who and stuff. He's been uh, adapting some just recently, you know, in yeah. the past few years. 
uh, which have been pretty good. Um, and of course, if you're a fan of the uh, the classic uh, uh, Night of the Demon, not our Night of the Demon, but the other one, <laughs> uh, uh, that is also adapted from an M.R. James story. He's great. Um, he doesn't have a very uh, prodigious output. Um, you know, you can find his collected uh, ghost stories uh, for a song, and it's, you know, it I think there's maybe 40 stories in total, a uh, fewer actually, um, but they're almost all classics. Um, you know, he really sort of shaped the Edwardian period of uh, ghost literature, both, you know, over in England, but here in America as well. Um, and if you, you read these stories and you like them, uh, there is a, a wealth of uh, ghostly supernatural fiction uh, written by people who are, you know, inspired by or working in the same mode as James that you can get into. Right. Um, so much. I mean, so much that was published in periodicals that you still have stories that are being rediscovered and published for the first time since, you know, 1896 uh, oh my, today. It's crazy. Awesome. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, James is great. Definitely check him out if you have not. You won't regret it. Other recommendation, uh, one that's probably a little bit more broadly familiar, is, of course, Shirley Jackson. Everybody should read Shirley Jackson. Yes. Um, you know, I think most people at one time or another, if you, uh, you know, go to school in America and take like a college or even maybe a high school English class, you might encounter her famous short story, The Lottery. Um, but the thing is, she wrote a lot more than that. And The Lottery is a great story. There's a lot more that's just as good, if not better. And frankly, a lot weirder. Um, she yes. has a whole lot of uh, supernatural stories um, that I would very much recommend. Uh, a lot of the best ones have recently been collected by uh, Penguin Books in this uh, collection called Dark Tales, uh, which if you just want a quick sampling of her supernatural stories, that's a good way to go. Also, the collection uh, The Lottery uh, uh, used to be called Demon Lover, but it was retitled because The Lottery was so famous. Uh, the Lottery and Other Tales, uh, that one's a great one too. Um, and again, it's a situation where most of the other horror stories, which sometimes they're very subtle horror, they're not in your face. Sometimes you might not even classify them as horror, just like very, very strange are contained in, in that book too. And of course, her novels, um, The Haunting of Hill House, uh, which I think people are, are generally, uh, even if you hadn't seen uh, either version of The Haunting before, uh, you might be familiar with it now because of uh, the Netflix Mike Flanagan adaptation. Um, which, you know, even if you've seen that and you liked it a lot, read the, read the book because it's quite different. Yeah. I was um, going to say. Yeah. Uh, very different. And, you know, you, I think you appreciate what Flanagan's doing with the material, uh, when you're, when you're familiar with the original stuff. Um, but that's a, a really wonderful novel. Other ones that are, you know, sort of horror adjacent, like, uh, we have always lived in the castle. Yes. Um, uh, the sundial. Yes. Um, yeah, she's great. Definitely read her deeply. One other person I wanted to highlight who I think is a, uh, if you like, you know, fiction like Shirley Jackson's that I think is worth checking out, uh, would be uh, Arthur Machen. Are you familiar with him? I am not. I don't know if I've heard that name before. Yeah, he's a great one. Um, so there's a number of uh, writers who sort of get lumped into this this one category of early 20th century supernatural fiction of a certain type, like uh, Algernon Blackwood, yes. um, William Hope Hodgson. Um, I think they all sort of fall into this this broad category of like doing kind of really interesting and different things with supernatural fiction uh, at this point in time. Arthur Machen is uh, one of my favorites of the type because his work is pretty varied. It's also not very long. I mean, I, I have, you know, his complete uh, uh, supernatural fiction spread out over, you know, three fairly slim volumes. Um, but every story is interesting and strange. Um, he's got um, some pretty famous ones about sort of a very sinister take on like fairy legends. Um, like the great God Pan is uh, one that you may have heard the, the, the name of before. Um, he has this uh, novel that's composed of a bunch of different short stories with this really creepy uh, frame narrative called The Three Imposters. Um, which I think is very much worth looking into, too. Um, a lot of the individual stories in it are pretty uh, well-regarded and famous in their own right. Um, so, yeah, if, you, if you're looking for, like, uh, <laughs> if you're looking for, like, somebody like Lovecraft, but a little bit less racist, uh, Arthur Machen's a good one to go for. 
Uh, you mentioned Algernon Blackwood. I actually very recently uh, remembered that I'd picked up a collection of his uh, supernatural stories mm-hmm. for a song on frickin' uh, use on Amazon, and mm-hmm. I I dug into his stories, and I had no idea what I was getting into. And at a few points, I had no idea what I was reading. <laughs> uh, Algernon, that dude is a strange, strange writer. I was yeah. not expecting so much cosmic horror. Oh yeah, just like boom, like like capital C cosmic horror, man. I was like, this is wild. So I look forward to. Uh, looking into more of his stuff yeah for sure blackwood's great so yeah those are all the the classics i chose uh just a a little sampling nice let's move into the just as important uh but not so much classics um (laughs) as of the uh horror fiction of the 1970s well haha jokes on you because i chose all classics oh schmidt Um, yeah, the seventies is a great era for horror fiction. I mean, well, you the know, 70s, I, you know, not yeah. like <laughs> literature classics. Like, obviously, no, you know, hundred years literature. from now, these will all be classics, <laughs> considered highbrow literature. Oh. Well, they're already classics in my brain. Hey, I agree. Um, this author's work stretched into the nineteen eighties, but I think he's, you know, most of his best work came out in the nineteen seventies. Huge fan of his work. Um, It is totally singular in my eyes. Um, Whenever anybody describes someone's work as being like his, and then I read it and it's nothing like it, I'm like, (laughs) Uh, and that is uh, Robert Aikman, who is uh, just a a masterful short story writer. Um, He wrote a a handful of novels, um, which are interesting but not really. They don't really hold a candle at all to his stories. Um, he described his stories as being, quote, um, strange stories. He didn't even really call them horror fiction, although they very, very definitely are. Um, they are like at their softest. They are bizarre. Um, very few of them fall under really any conventional understanding of, of like horror tropes. Like there's this one story, uh, that's like a vampire story and it's pretty clearly a vampire story, but, and it's pretty unremarkable for that fact. Um, but the rest of them, and he wrote quite a few of these strange stories are just baffling. Um, pro- I don't think you'll ever read anything quite like them. He is an English writer. He actually, if I'm not mistaken, oh, I'll sound like such an idiot if, oh no, yeah. So he's uh, he's actually related to, his grandfather is the uh, English horror writer Richard Marsh, who wrote The Beetle, which is a uh, kind of, uh, it predates Dracula, I think by like a year or so, but is a, a great sort of Dracula precursor. And he wrote a bunch of other supernatural fiction wow. as well. Yeah, um, but uh, but. He doesn't do it. Robert Aikman doesn't do anything quite like that. Um, again, his stories are are incredibly, incredibly strange. They're deeply like repressed and uh, sadly sexual. Like <laughs> very little sex is actually happening, but like everything is clearly about sex and aging and dying. And uh, they're, you know, you could have a, a field day trying to psychoanalyze these. Um, <laughs> Robert Aikman was apparently a he was really into like uh, waterways like canals and stuff um it is his like real life and then beyond that apparently he was like a bit of a monster to people but uh yeah he was kind of like a weird guy who just wrote these amazing stories they're all mostly in print today i think almost all of them are fairly easy to find uh, Faber and Faber in um, England, but they, you know, they publish in America too. Uh, recently republished some of these really nice uh, looking editions uh, in like the middle of the last decade. Uh, Cold Handed Mine, uh, Dark Entries, The Wine Dark Sea, The Unsettled Dust. All of these are, I think, totally essential collections that you should pick up if you want to just be gobsmacked by a story that leaves you like s- delightfully scratching your head. Have you ever read Robert Aikman? Or, no? I've heard the name. I have not read anything by him. Interesting. Yeah, he's uh, he's great. Not much of his work has been adapted. As far as I know, his work has only been adapted for TV. Maybe that's where I've heard the name. 
Well, yeah, none of them in in movies, only in like TV shows. Um, one of his stories, a really good story. In fact, it's the lead story in um, that collection, Cold Hand in Mine. It's called The Swords. It was adapted for uh, The Hunger, uh, the TV series based on the Tony Scott oh, adaptation yes. of the Whitley Stryber book. Uh, yeah, uh, that was an episode of that. And one of his stories was adapted by actually Mark Gaddis. Uh, or no, well, Mark Gaddis stars in it. Um, Jeremy Dyson, who's another one of the, what is it, League of Gentlemen? Is that what they're called? Yes. Yes. The person who did, uh, he did ghost stories as well. Yeah. Uh, he directed it, but, uh, yeah, they did, they did that one back in 2002. And then there, there were a few of his stories adapted for like in the eighties for some English TV show. And like in England, as they always do, they just like trash stuff after they make them. Um, they just like throw it in the bin. We don't need that anymore. It aired. Uh, so they were lost for a long time, but recently they have popped up on YouTube. Um, and, uh, you can watch them there, like an adaptation of the hospice, another one of his, uh, really great stories. Cool. Um, so worth checking out Ooh, uh, with uh, a uh, screenplay by Robert Smith of the cure of the cure. Mm-hmm. He only um, worked on Fridays though. <laughs> uh, well, no, those are his days off. No, 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 no. He liked to work his love. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Uh, so my second choice here is um, a man named Ken Greenhall. Now, Ken Greenhall, the two books I'm going to reference are titled Elizabeth from 1976 and uh, Hellhound, a.k.a. as I originally knew it, as Baxter uh, from... What's that one from? 1977. So those came out in successive years. These are absolutely amazing novels. Um, They uh, are very slim novels. Uh, When they were first published, they were actually published under Ken Greenhall's uh, mother's maiden name. So they were originally uh, known as uh, being published by Jessica Hamilton. Hmm. They were championed by the likes of Will Erickson and Grady Hendrix. So they were recently reprinted by Valancourt Books. Uh, that's, I can't believe I made it this far into this podcast uh, before mentioning Valancourt <laughs> Books. Um, I love them. They are, if you are interested in uh, more contemporary horror fiction. You know, for me, I'm talking about 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, if you're interested in like Victorian and Edwardian um, horror fiction, if you're interested in gay interest fiction, uh, Valancourt is like where you gotta go. Uh, they are absolute superheroes, uh, publishing in beautiful new editions. All of these absolute classics. Um, you know, really, my my the number one suggestion I could take, uh, I want you to take away from this podcast is just go to Valancourt Books, look around in their catalog and buy whatever you think looks good because uh spoiler it is it's very good (laughs) because they're they're cure they're curating stuff like they're really bringing stuff back that should not have been forgotten absolutely that is like their stated mission um and they do it perfectly um they are really painstaking in in both going out and you know tracking down the rights for unjustly forgotten books and in some cases you know even going and finding like one of the last copies that exists in a library somewhere of a very old forgotten book and like transcribing it you know they are extremely dedicated and are doing something very important uh so they did this for um these ken greenhall books and uh they are amazing uh both of them uh i like i I love them both it's hard for me to pick one i think that baxter is maybe a little bit more affecting of a novel in some ways or excuse me hellhound is what it goes under I, i prefer baxter it's that's the story of a totally sadistic homicidal dog, but from the dog's POV. So we are in the dog's head as he is planning these murders and developing this relationship with a totally sociopathic uh, little boy um, who he becomes uh, the pet of. 
Um, totally brilliant. Uh, Elizabeth is about a uh, 14-year-old girl who discovers uh, that she can talk to this sort of witch in a mirror and that she has some sort of uh, power, witch, witchy powers that are uh, uh, blossoming within her. And uh, she abruptly uses it to destroy her whole uh, lecherous family. Nice. Um, so both of these are amazing. They are very quick reads. They are are uh, absolutely beautifully written. Uh, both of them are in first person. And again, one of them is from a dog's perspective. Uh, and uh, they, uh, I think, nail the first person POV, making them as like as thorny and as uh, memorable as possible. Um, now, Baxter was a, at a, was a, um, adapted, was adapted to a, yeah. a film. It was a, a French film that was a, a fairly popular, I think, art house hit. Nice. Yeah, and it's actually being put out on Blu-ray, um, I think, by Kino Lorber and maybe Scorpion releasing as part of that one cool. um, sometime later this year. Um, it's a good film. It's a pretty good adaptation. You know, it's I think it's because it's such an sort of interior book, you know, stuck in this dog's head. There's only so much they can do, um, even with like voiceover, uh, which they do do. But I think they, they get pretty close. It's a it's a very, very strong adaptation. All right. So my next, uh, my next ones are not necessarily recommending the full output of the authors, which for Ken Greenhall and Robert Aikman, I would say, go ahead, read anything you can find by them, uh, cause it's all good. Uh, these next two are just specific novels, uh, that I think are great from this period. Um, one of them is a book that is perfect for this chilly time of year. It's by Herman Raucher. It's called Maynard's House. Um, now, this is a story uh, about a man who inherits a house uh, from an old buddy of his, um, a Vietnam War buddy who died in Vietnam. And uh, this house is in the middle of nowhere in this tiny town. Oh, this book was actually published in 1980. But you know what? That's basically the 70s. So we're going to say it's <laughs> hey, 70s. It was written during the 70s. So it there was you written go. during the 70s. And it's, <laughs> you know, Vietnam. It's very in the mode of the 1970s. Uh, so he goes uh, to this house that he's inherited from his dead, uh, his dead buddy. And uh, shit gets wild pretty quick because it turns out this house is haunted by a sentient witch's hat. <laughs> what? and he gets snowed into this house now it sounds silly because how could how could like a big floppy witch's hat that's like flying around outside be possibly frightening it's terrifying um, that this book takes a somewhat ridiculous premise and makes it absolutely crazy um and uh weirdly uh psychological and um, ultimately pretty perplexing um, is a feat to be admired. Um, this one was out of print for a while, but it recently got a reprint um, that you can easily find from any bookseller. So I recommend checking it out. Um, another unconventional uh, sort of haunted house book uh, is one by an author you would not expect. Uh, her name is Anne Rivers Siddons. And uh, she mostly wrote books um, just about like Southern like communities. Um, okay. Most of them were like light dramas with comedic elements. Like, you know, uh, you know, you can imagine grandma reading one of her books. <laughs> uh, and then in 1978, she published a book called, and it's totally unique within her, her bibliography, uh, her very long bibliography, a book called The House Next Door. Uh, the House Next Door is a, a very modern sort of horror novel. It is a haunted house story, but it's unlike anyone you've ever read before because the haunted house is like this ultra modern house that has been built in this fairly, you know, um, uh, traditional suburban neighborhood. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, it inverts a lot of our expectations about a haunted house story, uh, and it has a really great um, narrative device of having uh, the haunting take place through the observations of some nosy neighbors next door <laughs> who are just like watching as like occupant after occupant of this house dies in horrific ways. <laughs> 
Um, yes. it's, uh, it's both very funny and very disturbing. <clears throat> um, it's a really great novel and it makes me wish that, uh, I mean, granted I have not explored Anne River Siddons, uh, works beyond this one, uh, except from just like reading about him. Uh, but uh, I wish she maybe, you know, dipped her foot into genre a little bit more cause she, she kind of nails it with this one. It sounds incredible. It's really, really good. It's like um, boarding was- house. It's a little bit like boarding house. <laughs> um, it was adapted into a Lifetime movie, uh, which Uh-oh. does it a disservice. Um, the book is much better than that. The Yeah, the, the movie is pretty bad, um, even by Lifetime standards. Uh, but the book, you got to check it out. It's a great one. Um. All right. So that's it for the 1970s. Uh, let's let's take a break there. Mm-hmm. The number one best-selling author R. L. Stein wants to give you lots and lots of goosebumps in three different book series. First, Goosebumps, where the terror began and the screams go on forever and ever. Then, give yourself goosebumps where you choose from 20 different scary endings. And don't forget, Goosebumps presents books based on the Goosebumps TV show with creepy color photos inside. From Parachute Press and Scholastic, available wherever books are sold. Write us to get information on how to join the all-new Goosebumps fan club. Goosebumps, they're so good, it's scary. So let's jump into the 80s, the 19ers. See, actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because I <gasps> I neglected one from the 1970s. Rewind. It's actually a really important one. It's another uh one novel I'm recommending. And in this case, it's not because, you know, I'm going to besmirch uh the rest of the bibliography of this author. It's because there is no more bibliography of this author. <laughs> Um, not that, uh, she just stopped writing. Well, I mean, she did. And it's because she died right after this book. Her first novel was published. She died of cancer, uh, tragically, um, which is, you know, a, a, both a human tragedy and a, a tragedy for, uh, appreciators of good fiction, because I can't even imagine what her career would have been if she'd, uh, uh, published more. Um, this book also was recently republished by, um, uh, Valancourt Books, although used copies that are very easy to find as well. Uh, it's the novel The Auctioneer by Joan Sampson. Uh, this book was published in 1976, uh, excuse me, 1975, I guess. Uh, right smack dab in the middle of the 1970s. Um, this is a totally harrowing novel um, where the horror is entirely human. You know, there's no real supernatural. Uh, there's some stuff that's like vaguely like diabolical that's going on. Um, but nothing here is outside the realm of human capabilities. And it's about um, small town uh, turmoil and uh, pressure and violence as this one weirdly slimy charismatic individual rolls in town and begins basically through this veneer of uh, civility and charity begins basically stealing the goods of all of the people in town, um, forcing them to to donate them to these auctions that he's profiting off of and ultimately using the local police force to intimidate uh, those to uh, anyone who sort of resists it to giving in. Um, it's a, a book that um, Stephen King ripped off pretty horrifically in um, his, bu- his book Needful Things. I was just going to say, yeah. this sounds a little familiar. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, Stephen King, as he does, just makes all of the subtle things in, the, in this extremely obvious and stupid in his book. <laughs> um, but this, this is an absolutely uh, engrossing and um, horrific novel. Uh, I think all the more horrific because it is, you know, absent of of the supernatural. Absolutely something that I think everybody should read. 
um, for the, the the power of it. I think it's a really affecting novel um, with some important things to say about <laughs> humans and this weird society we have. Yeah, um, Brad read that and he was telling me it, it, it did not restore his faith in humanity. No, definitely not. Um, you know, you do see the uh, the sort of <laughs> resilient and somewhat dumb courage of uh, this family that tries to stand up to this person but kind of just standing up by giving in um it's 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 a tough read um but very much recommended so putting the 70s to bed uh which we should because it's sleepy uh let's move on to the 1980s um so i have uh four different things i would like to recommend from this period now this is the period of you know this is sort of the the boom time for cheap tawdry horror paperbacks. Oh boy, um, howdy! Yeah, so when Stephen King sort of blows up in the seventies, the eighties is the result of that, and you have, I mean, so much, so much horror fiction is produced in this decade. Uh, a lot of it um, from this period in like the very early nineties is, you know, there's a lot of trash, uh, but there's a lot of gems too, uh, including a lot of gems that were published, you know. Uh, in some cases like this, this first case by, you know, originally in mass market paperback, you know, didn't even have hardcover, you know, first editions, um, but nevertheless are total classics. Um, so my first author who I would recommend, because I would recommend virtually everything he ever wrote is Michael McDowell. Um, are you familiar with Michael McDowell? No. Okay. So he's another author who uh, very fortunately has been almost totally saved uh, by Valancourt Books. Um, They have published most of, I mean, um, I think they have published all of his horror novels, of which there are quite a few. Um, And he has a a few other uh, novels that are are really interesting too. Um, Though I think, you know, if you've never read one of his books, you're probably still familiar uh, with him in one sense or another. Um, He wrote the original screenplay for Beetlejuice. Um, It was changed a little bit. Uh, It was made more comedic and a little bit less horrifying (laughs) when Tim Burton uh, uh, directed it. Um, He also worked on an early uh, draft of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, But he did a lot of work in particular for um, television as a screenwriter later on in his career. Um, He wrote episodes of Tales from the Dark Side, um, Tales from the Crypt. He did one episode of that. uh, Monsters, if you're familiar with that show. Um, He also wrote two of the segments uh, from Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Um, Ah, okay. Yeah. So he did a lot of uh, screenwriting work later on in his career. Um, Sadly, later on in his career was also when he was um, beginning to to be ill. Um, He uh, he eventually died uh, right before the turn of the millennium uh, from, uh, you know, complications having to do with AIDS. Um, He is uh, or was a gay writer. Um, who, which that sometimes comes out in, uh, in particular, uh, a mystery series he wrote as, uh, with another writer as Nathan Aldean. Um, these are really great. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a sub bar to this. They're called the Valentine and Loveless, uh, novels. And it's basically like a, uh, gay metropolitan thin man type books about uh you know this gay man and his uh sort of flighty best friend um as nice. they solve all these uh these murders in uh, uh the boston's gay community uh those are a lot of fun um but it's for his horror novels that he's he's most well known um of those i'll mention a few his first which was published right at the very end of the 70s uh 1979 the amulet Um, is a great one. Um, This is basically like if Final Destination uh, (laughs) was centered around this weird amulet that's being passed around within this small southern community in uh, Alabama. Um, the, the, the death scenes are absolutely crazy, um, way over the top and ridiculous. Um, but it's also got like, um, some really good, uh, character work being done in this book in all of his novels, really. Uh, I think that the thing to mention most about him 
is that he most of his books you would classify as um, either sort of southern gothic or uh, sort of like historical horror fiction. Um, but it's the southern gothic ones that he's best known for. And he has this particularly wry and uh, sort of incisive way of constructing his characters. Um, particularly, he has a lot of uh, really uh, fascinating female characters that he writes uh, oh, cool. over the course of his novels, including a lot of like matriarchs who are like, uh, you know, very complicated monsters. Um so the amulet is a great one for that. I think, I think that one would probably appeal to most um, uh, readers who like, uh, you know, their their horror a little bit more over the top. Perhaps we might say, <laughs> "Cold Moon Over Babylon," which was published in the next year, nineteen eighty, is another great one. Um, this is a really shocking and surprising. Um, southern gothic horror uh, about sort of ghostly retribution i will say there are twists in this novel that happen like fairly early that just like leave your your jaw on the floor Um, okay you know what i i have a copy of that of cold moon over babylon yeah yeah so you you've got the original like shiny hologram cover Yeah, I just I just yeah. haven't read it. It's like a excuse me, foil cover is what how I describe yeah, it. Yeah, so I've actually heard of this dude. Yeah, it's a great one. I mean, Stephen King, who he obviously collaborated with a bit, um, he you know he also wrote the screenplay for uh, Thinner, <laughs> the oh. uh, Stephen King adaptation. Uh, not a great movie, not his best work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he collaborated with, with Stephen King quite a bit. Stephen King called him the um, uh, like the the greatest of paper horror back. Uh, pa- horror paperback writers of the 80s uh, and it's true uh, if you look at a work of his like uh, the elementals uh, from 1981 um, this is sort of like a generational uh, horror uh, novel about like this totally haunted family and it creates like this uh sort of like ancestral home in this really unique location um, that's sort of like uh set within like these sand dunes um so there's like all this sand that keeps on blowing in through like the various windows uh and there's like these ghosts that live in the sand and are haunting the house that one has some pretty strong beetlejuice vibes including from like this uh this main character well one of the main characters who is kind of like a uh you know a little bit of a a lydia uh precursor and then his epic he sort of did the whole green mile thing uh, uh you know a decade or so before uh steven king did by releasing um this one book split up into six different volumes that were released uh, i think monthly um in uh, 1983 or like monthly or every other month um and this is called the blackwater the, the book is titled blackwater or the blackwater books um and this is this is an absolutely multi-generational story of this one family or yeah really just this one family uh the caskies in alabama after uh, they have a sort of interloper marry into their family, uh, someone who very definitely has uh, supernatural connections and sort of sends this family over the generations in some very interesting directions. That one is an absolutely beautiful novel. Uh, again, split, it's very long. Uh, if you buy the um, complete edition of it now, I think it's over 800 pages, um, but it is uh, so, so very very worth the uh the effort i've seen those around i have not i do not have any of those yeah definitely recommend it yeah it's not one that you can just pick up any one of the books and read you really gotta really gotta read them all uh so michael mcdowell is my top pick for the 80s but i have a few others for you as well another author who's really interesting uh for a lot of reasons is a woman named lisa tuttle um, so now Lisa Tuttle wrote a number of novels, um, a lot of short stories, um, largely in the realms of horror and science fiction, and I recommend both. Um, I like her her work generally. Uh, I'm going to recommend in particular, though, uh, this classic collection of stories from her called A Nest of Nightmares. Uh, it has this really iconic cover artwork of a bunch of like horrifying chicks in a nest. They are the 
nightmares in the nest um oh yeah okay yeah uh this one uh (laughs) was a really sort of hot commodity for a while you know talked up a lot in um uh uh, paperbacks from hell and such uh but it did uh, recently receive a reissue in the paperbacks from hell reprints from valancourt books uh so i recommend picking it up there um her stories are pretty varied uh, and you know she has a lot more stories outside of that collection as well in fact valancourt just put out another collection uh, of her more recent stories because she's still around writing today although not quite as as frequently as she used to um and they're all good um you know they're very uh she writes she has a lot of um but although not to the exclusion, but a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, female uh, protagonists um, who I think have uh, really interesting dilemmas that they uh, are presented, uh, oftentimes supernatural. Her work is very, very strong. Definitely recommend checking it out. Another one I'm going to recommend, uh, surprise, surprise, it's another Valancourt Books author. Um, they're actually going to be republishing three more of his older novels uh, this year. I've already got copies of them, but what can you do? Uh, this is Stephen Gregory. Um, Stephen Gregory um, writes a lot of avian horror novels, meaning uh, horror novels about birds. Uh, It's not the only thing he writes. In fact, he's written some other stuff, too. Uh, But one of those bird books that I'll mention is called The Cormorant. Uh, This is from 1986. Uh, This was his debut novel. It is totally riveting. Uh, It's a very slim novel. It won't take you long to read at all. Um, It was actually adapted into a film. Uh, I believe for television in England, starring Ralph Fiennes, actually, in a pretty, you know, pretty young Ralph Fiennes. Um, and it's a pretty good adaptation, especially because of how hard this book would be to adapt uh, because it's about the absolutely bizarre relationship that forms between this man and this like evil cormorant uh, which is a what? bird <laughs> who he nice. sort of takes on as a pet and just makes his life absolute hell it is <laughs> it sounds like it would be funny and it is a little funny at times uh, but it is also just absolutely absolutely disturbing i also really like his novel the wood witch which was published two years later in 1988 um this one does not have uh bird stuff in it at least not you know uh, prominently uh it's actually about (laughs) about a mushroom (laughs) a mushroom in the forest that leads uh a man to do some really horrific things uh sort of the appeal of this weird it's weird mushroom so yeah mushroom horror and and what i like about that novel in particular is like you know you hear mushroom horror and you know you think about the 1980s and you're like oh so is it like mushrooms that start like you know growing on people and consuming them no no it's just a mushroom that drives a man insane <laughs> and it, it, so, it, so not matongo No, I I guess maybe the important thing I'm leaving out is that the mushroom that he's sort of obsessed with looks like a giant dick. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, as you can imagine, these are quite, again, uh, psychological, psychosexual horror novels. (laughs) Nice. Um, The last one I will mention uh, is an author who does not have a very large uh, body of work behind him. He did keep writing a little bit beyond this but it's pretty widely regarded even by the author himself that it was all kind of shit um that he only had like a few stories in him but all those stories were really good and this is the author t.e.d klein are you familiar with him i am familiar with the name i don't know if i've read any t.e.d klein though yeah um so he wrote really just a handful of stories um that are worth noting in fact the bulk of them are collected in this uh, collection from 1985 called dark gods uh dark gods is only four stories long um but they're pretty long stories each one is basically a novella um, and each one of them is a total classic. Uh, he wrote another one that's pretty important um, that was later vastly expanded into his only real novel um, called The Ceremonies, um, which was published around the same time. Dark Gods is the one I'm recommending, though. Uh, the four stories in that are, you know, each one is a classic. They're all very different uh, in their ways, and they're all very, let's say, 
kind of like updating the best way I would describe them is updating Lovecraft's sort of cosmic sensibilities for the 80s, which, you know, some other people were doing as well, but I feel like T.E.D. Klein does it the best. These are really wonderful, uh, and again, I'll use the term engrossing stories um, that are pretty diverse. Uh, you know, there's only four of them, uh, but they, I think they all have their own unique flavor uh, that, that one would, uh, one, I, I would be surprised if you didn't enjoy. Let's say that. Cool. I'll read that. Yeah, it's good. So that's it for the 1980s. Oh, man. Let's get into the <laughs> Z Cavariches. So the 90s, I made much shorter. I just put three things on my list for the 90s. But I do think they are all very good ones. Um, so my first selection is uh, someone who, for me, is very much synonymous with the edginess of 90s horror. Because the big difference between the 80s and the 90s is that the 90s... You know, whatever you thought of the 80s and its edginess, uh, the 90s were going to be edgier. Uh, <laughs> they were going to be grungier, darker, extreme. extreme. Now, that doesn't necessarily always mean like bloodier or gorier. In fact, I mean, I think you can turn back to the 1980s and find a lot of stuff that's that's more overt. But the 90s were just generally dirtier. Uh, you know, grungy is is, is kind of the, the idea of the period, right? Uh, so the inaugural volume in the Dell Abyss line, Kathy Koja's The Cipher, is my first choice here. Um, I would definitely recommend checking out more from Kathy Koja. Uh, she's a really great writer. Um, she wrote a number of novels from this time period, and she's still publishing now. In fact, a uh, short story collection of hers came out fairly recently that's, that's quite good, too. Um, but The Cipher is kind of like a good... I think it's very emblematic. It's kind of like a mission statement of what 90s horror was going to be. And this is about some uh, tortured artists and one tortured artist in particular who finds this weird hole, this weird hole in the ground in sort of an industrial environment that's called, he, he calls it the fun hole. And, uh, well, the fun hole does some not fun stuff to his brain and his body. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of a weird psychological body horror one that's very different from what you'd expect, you know, if, if you're if you're a fan of like general horror fiction, I think it yes. goes in some different directions than you that might expect. That is very apt because yeah. I read that as a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> and I, because, you know, I was, you know, into horror novels as a teenager and that book, that doesn't come at you in any way you've ever seen before. It's very different. Definitely. The next person I would recommend is someone who I think works in the same sort of broad aesthetics maybe a little bit more gothy, but also plays in some more recognizable horror elements is Poppy Z. Bright. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Poppy Z. Bright um, is the moniker of a now trans man named Billy Martin, um, but still goes by Poppy Z. Bright as sort of like the professional name because that's the name that everybody knows him by. A number of works from this period, like Lost Souls and... Um, uh, I'm going to, and Drawing Blood are two really good novels from this period, but I want to mention in particular a short story collection called Wormwood, which I think is kind of essential. Uh, these stories from a Poppy Z. Bright cover, a lot of like down and out characters, a lot of like, you know, people who are kind of transient, uh, moving around to, to various locations and encountering uh, bizarre stuff. They have, you know, this sort of... Um, Hmm. How would you say it? A kind of, um, I'm lost for words. Uh, I think the word grungy just captures yeah. it. Like, like it's, I'm just talking about lost souls. Sure. Cause that's the only one I've read, but it, it was very, very memorable for the way that she presented these characters as very real in, in their, uh, <laughs> tactile, like weirdness. I'm not trying to put it. And I think very sympathetic, too, yes, um, which absolutely. I think is uh, kind of a defining feature. Like, I don't really feel much sympathy for, for the characters in, like, Kathy Koja's novels, uh, but I do feel them in uh, Bright's novels, um, which I think is a, is a good feature. After Poppy Z. Bright, the, the last one I'm going to recommend 
is to go back to, um, uh, you know, the, the stuff that I, I admired at a distance when I was a child, but wasn't really actively reading. Um, I kind of skipped teen, teen horror novels as a whole because I kind of just moved on to like adult fiction, you know, uh, voracious readers sometimes I think have that problem where it's like they read kids books and they're just like, yeah, I'm just going to read Elmore Leonard now. That was my movement at least. And I'm imagining (laughs) other people are probably in that boat. Uh, so I missed out on reading the works of, uh, although again, I did admire their, their covers. It's kind of hard not to, uh, the works of Christopher Pike. Christopher Pike, uh, he of, uh, a number of neon, uh, covers, uh, with sometimes very direct titles is a total gem. He is kind of, you know, he was kind of like neck and neck with RL for a while there in the nineties. And his work is definitely the more sophisticated. It is at times, you know, he definitely has, much like R.L. Stein does, a, a few different things, hobby horses he likes to come back to. Uh, like, you you better get really used to hearing about um, sort of angelic, green-eyed, uh, red-haired young sisters if you're reading his novels. You have to get uh, used to a lot of, like, um, uh, Middle Eastern mysticism, particularly if you read his later books. Oh, boy. Uh, but it's awesome. Yeah, he is nevertheless, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, quite a good writer, at least a very engrossing and compulsively readable author um, who did not shy away from pretty mature themes and situations in his books. Like, you know, you read like the Fear Street books from Stein at this time uh, and Stein and his ghostwriters, you know, they they didn't like put a 10 foot pole distance between them and uh and like issues of sex they put like a football field between them you know <laughs> And if you were an actual teenager, you probably enjoyed reading Christopher Pike's novels a lot more because they did not shy away from that stuff at all. Um, and also, he actually wrote them all. You know, there's not a huge unending number of them. There's still quite a few, but he wrote them all and they're all very recognizably him. You know, he has a very distinctive uh, voice. One that I'll recommend in particular, I think it's sort of in a lot of ways uh, the pinnacle of his work and definitely gives you an idea of, you know, how he was the most authentic teen writer of the time is one called Whisper of death which uh would make a hell of a movie um it is apparently going to be adapted in this uh netflix series that mike flanagan is making of the works of christopher pike which is uh, very exciting Uh, he's apparently going to be adapting a bunch of the novels over the course of this uh series um whisper of death is about (laughs) it starts with a uh teen girl who is going to get an abortion but then it turns into a weird like possibly post apocalyptic novel and then switches to being a witch novel and in the end ends up being something that maybe gives a very convoluted message about the pros and cons of abortion oh (laughs) brother it is uh totally bizarre very confused and a hundred percent memorable um (laughs) which i would say most christopher bike books are they will uh, oftentimes just totally pull the rug out from under you, um, which is, I think, rare in what is otherwise, you know, if you read a lot of teen horror novels, which I do, they can be pretty formulaic. Uh, y- you're not going to be terribly surprised um, by what happens. You'll get a lot of laughs along the way, but you won't be surprised. You're reading a Christopher Pike novel, you will almost always be surprised in one way or another. Uh, so he's a, he's a big recommend for me. Did you read any Christopher Pike novels? Uh, I have not. I have one on my shelves, uh, but I cannot see it from here. Hmm. I just know the name and I know the covers. I've never read anything by him. Mm-hmm. So that is it for me for the 1990s. Nice. And so I have to turn it over to you uh, to hear what you uh, like and what you read and what you would recommend. Well, um, I got into horror fiction with a book called Benicula nice. by, uh, I believe by James Howe. Mm-hmm. I think that's the name. Mm-hmm. And I read the sequels. Um, I think he wrote them with his wife, maybe? What? Yeah, Deborah and James Howe. Um, and I read Holiday Inn, which is from 1982, which is very charming. Kids horror book. And I read the sequel, uh, The Celery Stocks at Midnight from 83. Yeah. 
And I read the third book, uh, Nighty Nightmare, in 1987. And what's really funny <clears throat> is in 1992, he wrote Return to Howl-A-Day Inn, mm -hmm. which 1992, I was in high school and still reading these, which is cute because mm -hmm. they were definitely no, not yes. – <laughs> they were not growing up with me. They were no. all like you – know. <laughs> but I never read past that. They made a few others. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually did a – a uh, made for TV cartoon of yes. Benicula. The it's really um it's really poor quality, so I haven't watched it yet. I can kind of tell, kind of get the gist of how they went with the adaptation. It doesn't seem to have captured the the magic of the books. They're very wonderful. I remember uh reading one at least in part out loud to my my mom who's a very patient woman apparently. Is the adaptation you're talking about um a film or is it the series? I don't know if it's a series. I think it was just a – I thought it was a one-off animated one. Gotcha. Because there is actually a series from oh. just a few years ago, I think. Oh, my uh, God. Where – get this. The voice of Banicula – is Chris Kattan, SNL's own Chris Kattan. Uh, and oh, uh, Lord. the best thing about that is that Banicula doesn't really have any lines. Banicula just goes like... Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> Banicula doesn't talk. <laughs> yeah, so they hired Chris Kattan just to, to make weird like mumbling so sounds as a bunny. <laughs> so the same year as the, the book, they did the animated one. And I believe it's on YouTube and varying quality there. But no, I did not even know about the Chris Kattan one. That's oh, yeah. the, well, it's on Boomerang, the, Boomerang, everyone's favorite network. Boomerang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my, like, uh, being thrown into a very cold swimming pool on a warm day was uh, when I was 11, I stole my parents' copy of uh, Misery by Stephen King mm. and proceeded to read Misery by Stephen King about mm. 11 or 12 times. Wow. I don't know why. I just got obsessed with that book and my parents noticed I was reading it and were like, well, he's reading. <laughs> they, I, I don't even know if they read Misery or not. I just kept reading it over and over again. I loved it so much as I'd never encountered anything like this. It was so insane. Uh. And so, of course... It wasn't long before I, I got into Stephen King and, and proceeded to read everything I could get my hands on um, up until uh, Insomnia in uh, the mid-90s, which was the book that I was like, why am I reading this guy's shit? I was so irritated with that book. <laughs> it's probably fine, but it just annoyed me to no end. Uh, and so I got out of that. But in the 80s... You know, taking in all that that trash, like you're talking about, that wonderful trash. Um, I definitely did not find any of the stuff in this episode so far, other than that uh, cipher, mm -hmm. other than the cipher. I I was all about Robert R. McCammon. Uh -huh. um, I love love still to this day love the trashy crap that is Robert R. McCammon. The only ones that I could sit down and read right now. <laughs> If you put a gun to my head, um, I would absolutely reread Stinger. If you can find Stinger, it's very fun. Mm -hmm. That inspired me to write my own version called Attack of the Alien Robot Zombies. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the night boat. The night boat is excellent. It's a <laughs> zombie U-boat that uh, shows up. I believe it shows up in Jamaica or somewhere around there and starts terrorizing people. It's very gory and very fun. Mm -hmm. uh, very short, too. You can blast right through that. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've read everything I can get my hands on from him. And uh, Wolf's Hour was very important to me as a kid because it had lots of sex in it. So I was like, ooh, this is great. Isn't that one about like a um, a werewolf who fights Nazis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he knew his audience well. Yeah, he knew, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like werewolf Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, the other guy I got into um, because of my good friend Scott, uh, he was telling me about this the necroscope series by brian lumley and i proceeded to read i guess five of them they're so long and so intricate and bonkers it's about a guy named harry keo who uh, discovers that he can speak to the dead and he begins to find out there's this uh conspiracy going on and a man trying to take over the world who's a necromancer and so he battles with this guy, and it's it's wild. The the, the whole series is wild, and of course, uh, vampires get brought into it. And there's yeah. that there's a whole bunch of sequels. I haven't read any of the sequels. His sons uh, are vampires, and they go on to this vampire realm, 
and you get all this like crazy <laughs> it's like uh, just the only thing i could compare it to would be like uh brian lumley was trying to like do like dune or something i don't know what he was doing it's <laughs> it's crazy uh he wrote a book called um House of Doors, which is a, a fun romp, a very gory, wild romp where these people, uh, a disparate group of people find themselves trapped in this interdimensional, like, place that's like a series of doors, and it takes them all over this, like, it just takes them to other planets, and they have to fight things and get away from traps and crazy creatures, and it's wild. Yeah, he's, he's a strange dude, but mm-hmm. a very pulpy mm-hmm. would be a good word yes. for uh, Sounds for right. both of them. Yeah, yeah. McCammon and Lumley, very pulpy. John Saul. I read a lot of John Saul. I, I, I was in the John Saul fan club for many years. <laughs> I got more mail. If you took all the mail I got from that and put it in a pile, it would still be bigger than how many John Saul books I read. <laughs> uh, but the ones I read, I really dug a lot. And of course, I got into H.P. Lovecraft, that that old racist um, and I, I really devoured a lot of his stuff. Um, one day I found out that uh, August Derleth had written some of his shit, right? Well, I mean... Or just... There was like at least one novel I read was probably not written by H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, I mean, Derleth wrote a lot of Cthulhu mythos stuff that may yeah. have been like represented as being by H.P. Lovecraft, but yeah, it was yes. not actually. But uh, yeah, I read a, a ton of Lovecraft. I, I still enjoy him. Even though he was a terrible human being. Yeah. What else did I get my grubby little hands on? Uh, Shirley Jackson, as you mentioned. I, I really, uh, I loved The Sundial. Um, I loved, um, We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Those are perfect, perfect things right there. And then I got away from the horror fiction for a long time. Um, I read a lot of literature. Uh, I actually said to my friend Scott on the phone, it's like, Scott, can I borrow some of your books? Like, you know, I'm not afraid of big words. <clears throat> I said that unironically, and he proceeded to make fun of me for months after I said that. It was so funny. I ain't afraid of big words. Mm-hmm. So eventually, uh, <laughs> got back into shopping for um, for horror novels and, and tracked down some of those those things I've been looking for for many years, the aforementioned Lumley books and the McCammons. And then uh, I got paperbacks from hell and was just blown away. And I read a few things. Uh, Jacob Gustafson very kindly sent me Gila, <laughs> the Gila friggin' book, which explains to you how to pronounce <laughs> Gila it's, monster. It is important. Um, that book is totally stupid. Um, every time... There's a resting point in the novel. The main lady and the main dude have sex. It's really stupid. Mm-hmm. Very funny. I, want- I, just, it just, I can't remember who wrote that book. Well, see, it's uh, credited uh, to someone named uh, Les Simons. Yes. Um, however, that is a pseudonym. The actual author of that book is a uh, woman named uh, Catherine Patasic, who is actually the wife of charles l grant holy shit she was horny <laughs> that's great so that leads me to uh charles l grant uh, the way that uh charles l grant is described in paperbacks from hell is these these books that um not a lot happens and they're very moody and just when you think that um something horrific is going to be around the corner there isn't it's just wind or a sound coming from a rattling air conditioner you know like it's always something it's always misdirection and he tries to put off the horror as long as he can because he's in love with setting the mood and he's in love with the characters and everything so sure enough i got into his um because i had no idea who he was no idea i probably read his short stories before didn't know it was him and got into his novels which he's not as famous for and i got into the um the ox run dead series which blew my mind because they were exactly the way they were described. Mm-hmm. Uh, I highly recommend if you can track down some Charles L. Grant. Uh, beyond that series, I've read some of his other books and I've yet to be disappointed. I've had a couple that I didn't love, but everything has been good. Um, and he loves to frustrate the audience. He loves to take you down a road where you don't know what the hell is going to happen. Very unexpected turns in his books. He's very strange. And I uh, need to get his short stories collections. Mm-hmm. 
I think that's that's most of my. I I read. Um, I used to get those uh, 100 great ghost stories and 100 great chilling tales. The, the ones that Barnes and Noble would put out in the 90s. Yeah. Because I was when I was a security guard, I would work from. Uh, six at night till six in the morning and i wanted to scare myself awake because i had trouble staying awake and <laughs> i had a lot of those um edited by somebody there was a guy i want to say amos was his name i can't remember it's uh, been too many famous years. the famous amos yeah he i would follow his different uh books that he edited because they're always really weird the stories were all over the place it was very uh, he pulled from all these disparate authors and dif- disparate types of um, stories. There was never anything that repeated ever. Guilty pleasure stuff would be uh, John Skip and Craig Spector. I'm already done with them. I remember <laughs> loving The Scream as a teenager. And then I read um, The Bridge, which blew my mind. It was so good. And I read a, their best one. Which is the vampire one? I'm the spacing. light at the end. Light at the end is, yeah. is is their best. It's so punk and it's so splattery. They should have called it like splatter punk or something. Uh, but it was really good. Um, but then I read the cleanup, and it's hideous. Mm-hmm. It's one of the worst books I've ever read for political reasons. Mm. Um, it was like one of those. It's like when you're in your 20s and you think the punisher is cool and or maybe hopefully you're not that old hopefully you're a teenager and then when you're an adult and you're like wow the punisher is really not cool (laughs) he's like and i'm talking about the comic book the movies the the movies of the punisher have been very fun and very silly obviously the, the the tv series of the punisher tries to make him a bit more realistic uh, but the Punisher movies are very fun, even though he's, you know, just a murderer. Mm-hmm. They're great. The comics are such a stupid jack off male fantasy <laughs> bullshit crap. They're so uh-huh. self righteous and awful. I can't even. <laughs> so bad. But yeah, the cleanup is basically that. And it was it was offensive. And I don't get easily offended. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the main ones. There's there's a few things I'm I'm forgetting that uh, I remember there was a, a zombie collection that made me nauseous when I was a kid. It was called Book of the Dead or Book of the Dead Two, mm. and I got it at the grocery store. So it was wildly shocking. It's to this day the the nastiest, goriest thing I've ever read. The fact that it was at the grocery store cracks me up. Interesting. Let's see. Oh, here we go. There you go. Book of the Dead. Of course, it has a Stephen King. Oh, of course, Stephen King, Robert R. McCammon, Ramsey Campbell, right on the cover. So that's why I picked it up. And man, that mm. book is disgusting. Mm. Um, oh, I've also read the, uh, just for funsies, I read the uh, sequel to Night of the Living Dead the that John Russo wrote, The Return of the Living Dead. <laughs> Which has nothing uh-huh. to do with the film Return of the Living no. Dead. <laughs> it is so bad. Mm. Oh my goodness. It's fun. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it takes the structure of the first one and does it again. <laughs> well, you liked it once, didn't you? <laughs> it's so cheesy. It's 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 worth checking out if you're really, really desperate, but don't get your hopes up. Quit all the complaining. Take it. Eat your slop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am definitely not above that. <laughs> I don't know. Is it is it is a flesh eater better than flesh eater? Oh, nothing. Nothing's better than flesh eater. What are uh, you talking that's about? That's what I thought. <laughs> well, Jeffrey, thank you for like just doing this whole episode. That was great. No problem. It's a pleasure. Please, everyone, go out and read some books. Exactly. Do you have any Stephen King that you go back to? <laughs> or that you you still remember fondly? Uh, yeah, I really uh, think fondly back on Sleepwalkers, the screenplay to Sleepwalkers. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I don't like Stephen King at all. I really love wow. almost everything made from Stephen King's books. I find him to just be a an absolutely god awful writer. Nice. Um, well, you know, it's that seventh grade reading level. Oh boy! Oh boy! 
all of the like folksy repeated phrases in almost every one of not even just his <laughs> novels where you think like oh maybe he wants to pad it out a little bit but like even in the stories too yeah. like take a shot every time college boy is said in a graveyard <laughs> shift jesus nice. christ nice. um you know, I will say um, there's one book of his that I didn't find uh, terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, I did read the first four Dark Tower books. Yeah. Uh, and I I didn't like the first three all that much. But the fourth one was pretty good. Uh, and then I was like, well, better better to quit here. <laughs> yeah, it's for the best. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I still enjoy uh, Skeleton Crew. And I still have a an intention to reread uh salem's lot because i i remember really loving that and i have a feeling i'll at least enjoy it again Mm -hmm. but uh yeah he really threw me i think adaptations of his stuff nowadays are the way to go i'm really into uh even though i don't like stephen king i do like a lot some of the early paperbacks that were published of his work um, particularly like the really bold ones that just like didn't even put his name or even sometimes the title of the book on the cover. Like the original publication of Salem's Lot is just like this creepy vampire face with like a trickle of blood that you can yes. barely even see because it's all black. Yes. Um, that one's very cool. I have that. Um, nice. There's like this uh, this uh, shiny foil version of The Shining that came out um, right before the movie came out. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and actually when you're talking about misery, that made me remember that I just found out that I think the first paperback release of misery had a step back cover. Uh, I think it was a step back cover. At least that's how it was described to me and what I saw where if you, if you sort of move, uh, the, 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 the actual cover of misery back, it has a, uh, a romance novel cover that's meant to look like the novel that, uh, she forces him to write over the course of the book the misery returns or whatever and it's got a the handsome hunk who's like you know holding misery uh has stephen king's face like drawn on it (laughs) look it up it's very bizarre i uh, I did remember um i I really loved uh the one he wrote with uh peter straub the first one he wrote Mm. uh the talisman uh, that was one i really enjoyed as a kid and i'm gonna be really tacky and uh give a shout out to a writer Emma Straub, Peter Straub's daughter. I know her. She's a friend of mine. Really? She, she married one of my good friends, and uh, she yeah. was at my wedding. So look at that. I'm famous by proxy. Oh, that's very cool. Raise, Emma is a very cool person. Her books are incredible. To my knowledge, she has not written a horror novel yet. Hey. She's probably like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> There's always time. But she said the funniest thing when I met her. I was like, oh, yeah, Peter Straub. I used to read his books. And she's like, why did you stop? He's still writing them. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. So there you go. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Man, let's call, let's call this. So thank you for listening folks. I hope thanks to Jeffrey of massive lists and thanks to me. You won't ever trust my opinion on books again, but Mm. Hey, I was, I was also here. (laughs) Um, Good night. Sweet dreams. Unpleasant nightmares, brother. Hello, this is The Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is The Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com. 